There is no secret formula for better customer service. But there is the all-new service hub from HubSpot, bringing service and support together in one powerful platform so you could deliver the best experiences possible and free up a rep's time with an AI-powered help desk. Also, you can easily support and grow your customer base. Secrets out, everybody. Service Hub is a game changer. Visit HubSpot.com slash service to learn more. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday, May 23rd. I'm John Weigel with Juliet bennett Ryla and Ben Berkeley, and this is the Hustle Daily Show. We all know the iPad that crushed art, but Apple used to be interested in crushing the video game industry. Today, we're jumping into our failed product series where we assess a business venture that didn't quite go to plan in the form of a specific product. This time, it's about Apple and their brief foray into gaming consoles with Apple Pippin. Did this device have the tools to dominate gaming in 1996, or was it doomed from the very start? We'll chat about all that in a bit, but first, let's give you the hits and headlines today across business and tech. So take it away, Ben. Oh, well, thanks so much, John. Let's get things started off with Boeing. If you're wondering if this is going to be good or bad news, again, I say Boeing. Not great news. The company's spacecraft has been grounded indefinitely. Its long-delayed Starliner is going to be delayed far longer as they work out a helium leak. Earlier this month, Starliner's first crewed mission was counting down on the launch pad when it was nixed. And these precautions are both good for business and bad for business. Obviously, with the company's aircraft safety under fire this year, the last thing they need is a space disaster to add to the mix. But on the other hand, Boeing can't start fulfilling the terms of its multi-billion dollar NASA astronaut transport contract until the ship is fully operational. On a lighter note, let's move over to Mattel, which is eyeing the gaming world. The toy company inked a deal with Outright Games for three PC and console games based on its Monster High, Matchbox, and Barbie brands. After last summer's Barbie movie made nearly $1.5 billion, it was probably only a matter of time until they started stretching that IP across every medium imaginable. You know, I'm not currently recording this on a Barbie-branded microphone, but if Mattel is listening, uh, I probably will be in like a week tops. While we're on the subject of squeezing every possible dollar out of iconic brands, we've got a collab to talk about with really some beautiful symmetry to it. One year after W.K. Kellogg introduced an icy flavored cereal, Icy is now bringing a W.K. Kellogg cereal flavored frozen beverage into the world. And it's not just any Kellogg cereal, but its absolute finest one, Fruit Loops. If you happen to be an ornithologist who's listening and you want to come on the show and explain whether Toucan Sam is more or less susceptible to icy brain freeze than the rest of us, please email us. Seriously, that would be fascinating. And finally, as we get deeper into graduation season, our congrats go out to the class of 2024 and so to our condolences. New graduates are merging into an absolutely atrocious job market. An employer survey shows U.S. companies plan to hire 5.8% fewer college grads than they did in 2023. Ouch. The bulk of our hustle team, you know, we actually graduated into the Great Recession in the late 2000s. So we are proof that it gets better, but we are also proof that there's really no statute of limitations on griping about graduating into a terrible job market. So at least there's that. We'll spare you any more of that. John, let's talk Apple. You may have heard of Apple's Vision Pro, a device that had seemingly endless possibilities upon its release in terms of bending reality and even gaming. But did you know that Apple tried to get into the gaming space long before that? Apple Pippin is an often forgotten Apple gaming console that didn't really catch on. Juliet, what exactly is Apple Pippin? So this came out in 1996. Mm -hmm. It was Apple's attempt to get in on the whole console gaming situation. Actually made it through a partnership with a Japanese toy maker called Bandai. So they actually didn't produce the hardware. Mm -hmm. But like other consoles, you plug it into a TV. It had kind of a pared down Apple operating system. So it was pretty fast. It wasn't terrible is what we're saying here. It was fast. It worked. Apple envisioned the Pippin kind of as an everything machine. Mm which is kind of how it's marketing the Vision Pro. Obviously, you can play games on it and have a form of entertainment, but it also saw it as being educational, like this thing you plugged in. It was in the living room. You could do all sorts of things with it. It could connect to the internet. It could support a keyboard and a mouse that had a wireless controller. So not a bad product all in all. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad. 1996, though, pretty interesting time to get in on the console wars over here because the main players at the time were like, you know, Nintendo 64, the first mm -hmm. PlayStation was just coming out and Sega Saturn were kind of the main players at the time. So to get in at that period and taking a look at this device, it does look like it was made by Bandai. It does very much <laughs> yeah, yeah. look like a cartridge clunker, as I like to refer to them. Oh, absolutely. It did not have like these sleek Apple modifications that we know and love today. And really the undoing of the Pippin was its rivals at the time. Mm. Um, it's kind of a thing that Apple always does. The Vision Pro, as you know, is $3,500, which is truly thousands more than um, a lot of its competitors. It's more than the Quest. It's more than any other consumer headset out there. Right. I think the Oculus, when it first came out, was like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So mm -hmm. much like the Vision Pro, that was the problem with the Pippin. The Pippin was about $600. That's over $1,000 today. And the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation were both about half as much. So it was just kind of like... Why do this when I can have this for half the price? Right. With more games and by a more famous developer, right? Nintendo having some time in the space previously. Mm -hmm. PlayStation, weirdly, yeah, this was PlayStation's first go of it, but still they had quite a lot of originals to offer. And I think just the amount of games you get with an Apple Pippin versus the rest. I'm actually not sure. Do you know what kind of games that they offered for the Apple Pippin? I looked at some of them and it was just, I don't know, they only came out with about 25 games. Okay. That was a lot fewer titles than they thought they were going to come out with. Wow. They kind of had uh, some reluctance from developers to even sign on. There wasn't a lot of info and the Apple team dedicated to it was kind of short staffed. So they just didn't really have the kind of push that they thought they were going to have. And then people didn't buy it because it was very expensive right? and it didn't really offer anything that the other more known consoles could offer at the time. This is kind of a very fascinating experiment, too, because I imagine it took a lot to develop it if they sold it for such a large price. But this is really funny as a trend that Apple seems to do consistently, which is just completely overpriced their devices. And now it kind of seems like that's a bit warranted, depending on how sleek and nice and shiny they are. Mm -hmm. But looking at the Apple Pippin, it does not look like it should be worth double any other <laughs> gaming console of the time. No, and it was kind of an interesting project that they had. It was a Macintosh clones project where essentially they would have devices, computers, or in this case, a console that another company made. And so those companies would make the actual hardware, but Apple would be responsible for the software. So yeah, you weren't really getting even a full Mac product here. It was, you know, this partnership. And then when Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997, he just pulled the plug on that entire program. So any situation where a third party company was creating the hardware, like he brought it back to right. this everything Apple all the time, walled garden situation. Right. And that included the Pippin. So not only did they not sell very much, but Steve Jobs was just like, I don't like this project at all as a whole. <laughs> he basically just pulled the plug on the whole thing. Great. I very much enjoy the vision of Steve Jobs coming back into the office after a long leave of absence and saying immediately, no, not that. That's going away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish we could see what that meeting would have been like because it was probably actually really chill. And it was just like, mm, let's focus on this and not that. I but I like to imagine him like smashing a Pippin and being like, what is this? <laughs> This is terrible. This is what you do <laughs> yeah. when I'm not here. But yeah, I think this is also an interesting indication of kind of where Apple would end up in the gaming space because, you know, things like Apple TV, Apple Arcade, Mac has kind of gained some functionality for gaming, not nearly as much as the PC does, but it has some capabilities. And they've always kind of had this air of you can play some games kind of. And that's even with Vision Pro yeah. where... You can't necessarily play like a PlayStation game on there, but mm -hmm. you could. It just wouldn't really work quite as well as it would on a TV. Yeah, I feel like there's always been this thing where it's like if you're a serious gamer or I don't know, even if you just want to play whatever game of the year is or whatever your friends are playing, it's very difficult to do on a Mac product. And it always has been. Mm -hmm. Macs were not originally designed for gaming. And they just never really caught up. It was kind of like this constant back and forth where it's like, okay, well, this isn't a gaming computer. So studios aren't going to develop games for them. Then if you're really into games, you're like, okay, well, I don't want an Apple computer. I want a PC because a PC will run the games that I like. To the point where as of January, 2023, 96% of players on Steam, which is one of the largest gaming platforms that we have, said that they gamed on a Windows machine because you know, there really wasn't any other choice. The only reason I have a Windows machine at all at this point is because during the pandemic, I decided I wanted to play Witcher 3. <laughs> so I bought one. You needed to. And uh, now, yeah, if I'm going to play games with friends, like I don't even consider 
opening up this Mac computer because it requires so many things. It's like, I think there's like a way that you can port games through it or you can do this or that or the other thing and you get an emulator. So it thinks that you're on windows or it thinks that right. I'm not going to do any of that. <laughs> you could just buy the PC and just let that happen. Yeah. I don't play games because I want uh, complicated real life side quests. I play games because I want fun side quests. Like, I don't know, go save this dwarf from a troll. Right. That's what I would like to be doing. Not real life quests. I agree. That's a much better use of your <laughs> yeah. time. But, you know, now we're in the situation where people don't really game on Apple. I remember once I logged into my Steam account and it was like, oh, because you updated a Catalina or whatever, it no longer supports any of the games you did have that used to even work on this. So, you know, oh my God. the only place where Apple does excel at gaming, I think, is when it comes to mobile games. There's a lot of games that mm -hmm. develop for iOS first as opposed to Android. But Right. Companies like Take-Two Interactive and King mm -hmm. are, are really, really good with mobile gaming. And iPhone lends itself very well to mobile gaming. Tap Tap mm -hmm. Revolution, anyone? Oh, baby. Uh, that was the stuff back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> I've never played this game, but I'm just going to assume that it was oh my like God. Dance Dance Revolution, except using one finger instead of your whole Exactly. Body. It is okay. Guitar Hero, but for your fingers. <laughs> Amazing. Spectacular. But yeah, so I mean, that kind of puts a cap on it. But it's very interesting to kind of go over this clunky history that Apple has with gaming technology and will it get any better with the next vision pro we don't know but uh, that'll be an interesting thing to keep an eye on i think yeah i'm super excited to see where the vision pro is within a year if people were like yeah i spent 3500 dollars on it and i played it every day i use it for workouts i use it to i don't know facetime with me i don't know what you do with it <laughs> <laughs> like I, I would love to see if people find applications for the Vision Pro that's like, yes, this is amazing on a Vision Pro and I use it consistently throughout my life in myriad ways. Right. And one of those maybe one day will be Elden Ring, but not yet. Actually, that'd be too hard. That'd be scary. I can't play 2D Elden Ring. I don't think I can be immersed in Elden Ring. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, and that'll do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in to the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email, and we'll see you later. Hey, everybody, I got a great podcast to tell you about. It's called Truth, Lies, and Work, and it's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. On this show, you can join husband and wife team Al and Leanne Elliott as they dispel myths, impart wisdom, and answer all your questions about finding, keeping, and motivating great people. They actually just did an episode with John Smith, who is the manager and agent of famous Argentinian soccer player Diego Maradona. He talks about in this episode how he was able to manage the global superstar athlete celebrity that Maradona is and was. It's a great listen. You better get out there and check it out. And you can listen to Truth, Lies, and Work wherever you get your podcasts.